everybody, and today is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, so we're rolling right through the summer, aren't we? It's so good to see you all. I hope you're doing well, and I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. Today we'll be looking at part of the Bible that's a bit complex, but I believe God has a, a lesson for us today when we do listen to this today, and I pray God will be blessing you all for being here today. So as we begin, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, I do thank you so much for this time where we are able to come together and be in worship today, where we gather, Lord, as your people. Father, we ask that you would give us a word today that would help lift us up, would help encourage us, and would help bring us closer to you. Lord, we thank you for each one that's here today. We also thank you those who could not make it. We ask your blessing upon them today as well. We now give the rest of this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You have another song that you should probably be familiar with, Be Thou My Vision. Jacob. 
Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. You know, when you read the book of Genesis, there's so many stories in here. It's good to go back and read the one before to get a really better grip of what's going on in the one that we just were reading. If you were here last week, you remember that we presented a story in Genesis where Sarah, Isaac's mother, had just died at the ripe old age of 128. And it was time to find Isaac a wife. So, remember, the servant was sent and the woman was found that was going to be Isaac's wife through a lot of supernatural work behind the scenes of God, bringing Rebecca to the family. And so, remember at that time, Isaac was 40 years old, so now he's 60, and then they give these twins. And I know that sometimes brothers and sisters will fight after they get born, but in the womb, that's a little unusual, isn't it? They were tussling inside of Rebecca. So she knew something was up, and she went to the Lord, of course, and the Lord explained it to her. So we'll look at this story as it continues, God willing, next Sunday. But Genesis is a great book. I love it. So full of great stories and truth. Today's psalm comes to us from the 119th psalm, verses 105 to 112. Another great section of the psalms here. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord. According to your word, accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. I'm more familiar with the very first part of that psalm than the end where we read that familiar story. Thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. You know you know that psalm, that story from maybe when you were a child. Some of the psalms that we have now about your word being a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And then we continue on down. And what I really like is where he makes that bold statement at the end. And he says, your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of of my heart. And then he says, my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. No matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances are, I'm going to stay true to you, God. I'm going to stay true to your word all the way through. So that's a great encouragement for us today. And now we will go to our gospel reading today. Another wonderful passage of scripture that you're familiar with, I'm sure. Matthew chapter 13. We'll read verses 1 to 9 and 18 to 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. And then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came out and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. They withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. 
Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. And then we skip down to the 18th verse, and Jesus is explaining this to his disciples, or to his, and we read what Jesus said to those disciples. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. And this is the seed that's sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because the word had he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And of course, that's what's known as the parable of the sower. I remember having a conversation a while back with Mary Feeker, who had a person, I guess as a mutual friend that I knew, this man's name was Jerry. Jerry was a pastor, and he, I think, had been retired. And Jerry was at a church that I was helping out at one time, and, and Jerry would show up at the end of the service every day with a bag of these Smarties, these little candies that you wrap and you pull apart and they glow little thing. Some of you guys are still eating Smarties, by the way, and you know, that's okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> but he would give them out to the little children. So we, I knew Jerry, and Barry said one time, he had a discussion with him at lunch or something of that nature, and he said, you know, how many people do you think really are going to receive the gospel? That, that hear it, and Jerry's kind of like that, 25%, and just keeps on, 25%. He said, well, yeah, I said, you know, there's, you sow the seed, and there's four types of soil. One's the path that it falls on, and the birds come and eat it away real quick. Then there's the shallow soil that doesn't produce much because the roots can't go very deep. Shallow soil, the sun comes up and scorches it, and they're dried up and burned up. And then there's the soil that's full of thorns and thistles, cockleburrows. By the way, when I get to heaven, God willing, I'm going to remember to ask the Lord, why did you invent cockleburrows and all of the different things that you made? Of course, by then it won't really matter, will it? But still, I wonder, what purpose do those serve? If anybody knows what purpose those serve, please do let me know. All I know is they get into my socks, and i got to sit there and pull them out in the summer every year. And then, of course, there's the, the good soil. But you know what's interesting to me is that we have a lot to say about the soil in our hearts, our life. It's not that we're a victim of our soil as much as it is the soil is part of what we make it to be. So if we're receptive, it's going to be good soil, and the seed's going to fall in. We just have to be ready. And I guess the good news is somebody might have a, a thorny soil or a shallow soil or a well-worn soil at some point, but that doesn't mean God's not going to be able to penetrate if that person's heart would change and become receptive. So we never give up. God never gives up on us, and we sure don't want to give up on anybody. But great scriptures this morning. I just uh, I thought these were just fantastic. Unfortunately, I can only choose one to do the sermon on as far as really focusing. So that'll be the one we'll read here in just a minute. But I believe in the meantime, we have another song. Page 431, right? Yep. Okay. Let there be peace on earth. I'm going to sing the original words. I don't know what's on the screen, but sing whatever you want.
I remember a friend gave me a little sign years ago. It said, no Jesus, no peace. N-O Jesus, N-O peace. And it said underneath it, no Jesus, K-N-O-W. No Jesus, and then K-N-O-W, no peace. So no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. I found that to be pretty true in my life for sure. So thank you for that message and music this morning. As we look into our sermon scripture today, I would ask that you follow along on the screen with this passage of scripture. It will come to us today from Romans chapter 8 and verses 1 to 11. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by, spending, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful man mind is a hostile towards God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature can't please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. May God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture here today. Bear with me in prayer, will you? Lord, we ask now that you would quiet our hearts. Lord, help us to just let everything else go that's of a concern to us right now, Lord. Just things that are going on around us. Help us to just give you the space that you need to work in our lives right now. May the words of my mouth, Lord, the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Well, it was October the 13th of 2017, almost three years ago. A man by the name of Lamont McIntyre walked out of the Wyandotte County Courthouse in Kansas City, Kansas, a free man. All charges against him had been wiped off the table. Not only that, his record was now clean. He says, oh, he never killed those two young guys up in Kansas City, Kansas, in 1994. Two homicides that he had been found guilty of, even though he maintained his innocence from the get-go. And so he was found to be without that crime. The... District Attorney in Wyandotte County got up and told the court that day that they weren't going to pursue the case any further because there had been a couple of groups that had come and tried to intervene on Mr. McIntyre's behalf and maintain that he was innocent all along, that there was really no evidence to convict him. And yet still he's there for 23 years in prison. He was set free, walked out of the Wyandotte County Courthouse, a free man, and again, completely without the crime. Almost as if he had never committed it, except in his own experience. Earlier this year, the state of Kansas in February awarded him $1.5 million for his wrongful conviction. Now, it doesn't bring back 23 lost years, but it was the state's responsibility and it was what they could do to help make amends. The day that he was released 
from prison. His attorney, Cheryl Pilot, said, Today, Lamont McIntyre has been declared finally and conclusively a completely innocent man. You know, it's one thing to be found not guilty, but to really be innocent, that's a whole different thing because that means you never did anything. Mr. McIntyre later was interviewed by KNBC TV Channel 9 in Kansas City. And I don't know exactly the question that was asked of him, but he gave this impression when I read this statement I'm about to read. It was probably, how do you feel after having been locked up for 23 years for a crime you didn't commit? Are you angry? So here's what he said. He said, it took too much time from me regarding his imprisonment. That's just too big of a price to pay. I'd rather just live life. Didn't want to spend his time being bitter. Didn't want to spend his time being angry. So today's scripture, as you just heard from Romans, talks about the law. There's all kinds of laws, aren't there? We go out of here in a few minutes and we're going to have laws all over the place. We can't now, I'm not going to call the police, but I know some of you folks do jaywalk going across the street. I'm not going to say anything. But, but we have laws like speeding and not running red lights and not running stop signs and all these types. Of, then there's all the other laws. So we're, we're surrounded by laws. The laws have been with us since the earliest parts of the Bible were written. Remember, even though there had been no specific law given... God told Adam and Eve what they were supposed to do and what they weren't supposed to do. In particular, don't eat of this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, as soon as they said that, I think they were like, oh, yeah, we won't do that. You know, we do that? you got to be kidding. I'm not going to do that, Lord. And then along comes the devil kind of, yeah, you, know, you really ought to try it. It's not going to hurt you. So we'll say the law provoked him to sin, but you know how it is. When somebody tells you not to do something, a lot of times we like to go ahead and do it. That's our rebellious nature. So, a mistaken conviction is one thing. In our case, we have been accused of breaking God's law. And as a matter of fact, we all stand guilty. Uh, there's not anything in our power that we can do. See, the Old Testament laws were generated to give a reminder on certain days of their calendar that we fall short of the law. The law that we could even just sum up today is the Ten Commandments. Those laws were designed to give us a view of what God expected of His people, of what God wanted us to do. And there's nothing wrong with those rules. They're great. Just think if we all kept the Ten Commandments. We wouldn't have people stealing things or killing each other or using the Lord's name in vain. All of these things will be done because we were all keeping it. The problem is we've not kept it and we paid the price for that. So we know that in our experience that we've all broken the law and there's nothing that we can do on our own to get off the hook because we stand guilty. Today's scripture from Romans, I'd like to go back and check one in Romans 3.23 that talks about this. It all kind of builds, Romans is one of these books that all kind of, it kind of builds like bricks on a house. So you almost have to go back prior to what we were just talking about to see what he's talking about now, the Apostle Paul. In that particular section, Romans 3.23, we know this verse, a lot of us memorize it, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I never looked at that as a hopeless verse. I just thought it was reality. It was just showing us where we were. Kind of like what the law does. The law just shows us where we're at. It's not designed to save us. We can try to keep it on our own human strength, but we're not going to be able to. Remember last week in Romans 7, if you were here, you might have heard this scripture, that the Apostle Paul said, you know, the good that I want to do, I don't do. As a matter of fact, the very things I don't want to do, I end up doing. 
I break the laws I don't want to break. I don't keep the ones I want to keep. Oh, wretched man, who's going to save me from this? And he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who has come to save me from this bondage to sin. So that's sort of the backdrop to what is going on here today. As we look at Romans 8, the first word in the New International Version says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I always say when there's the word therefore, you've got to go back and read what preceded it, right? No one just starts out a conversation with therefore. It'd be like saying, Looks like it's going to rain outside, therefore I'm going to go roll my windows up in the car. Or, I think my food's about to burn on the stove, therefore I'm going to turn the heat down just a little bit. Now, if I talk like that, my wife would probably have me committed if she's probably about that close now as it is. But something preceded what we're reading here today. And it's all about the law. Paul says in, I believe it's verse 8, possibly verse 12 of chapter 7. Excuse me, because I look for it. Well, for one thing he says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So that's in seven, chapter 7, verse 7. So the law shines a light on those things that we need to remedy in our life. Things that we cannot do on our own, however. Because when we try to maintain the law, we try to obey God in our own power. It usually doesn't last very long. We can do it up to a point. And then we find that we fail. We just can't do it on our own. So, nothing wrong with the law. Because in, in verse uh, 12 of chapter 7, he says, So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So there's nothing wrong with the law, but it does have its limitations. It can only do so much. The law is basically designed to point us to our need for a Savior. Just like... Lamont McIntyre had some good attorneys representing him, people that were advocating for him to plead his case. We have someone to plead our case, and that's Jesus Christ. He will plead our case to God. When we stand guilty as accused, Jesus is saying, well, God, that person knows me, has received my forgiveness, therefore, he's good to go. His sins have been wiped off the, the table. There's no more records of his wrongs. And so when God then sees us, he sees us as being the righteousness of Christ. Because that's what was given to us. Not, being, not by anything we did. We couldn't earn it by keeping the law. It was, what, it was what Jesus Christ did for us. The Old Testament talks about all the sacrifices that came around. The bulls, the goats, the sheep, they would sacrifice because only through the forgiveness or only through the shedding of blood was there going to be forgiveness of sin. But those sacrifices weren't designed to bring us into that forgiveness in the sense of being set free from the sin because they had to keep doing the same sacrifices every year. So if they worked once, that would be it. You had to keep doing them over and over and over. For centuries, they did these sacrifices. They're still doing them in some places. Jesus Christ came, and he was the final sacrifice. Amen. He came once and for all. So, what does that mean for us today then? It means we are no longer condemned. We are no longer guilty. We may feel like it. We carry around in our minds these memories and these images and the guilt that I believe Satan wants to keep putting on us. But remember, if you're having those thoughts. They're not coming from the Lord. The Lord sees you as righteous. He sees you as free. He sees you as clean. He sees you as set free. If you have these thoughts of bondage, that's coming straight from the devil. And so you have to make sure that you get yourself reset if those thoughts start coming into your head and just say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to think about those anymore. And just say, Lord, help me to claim the promises that you gave me. I'm a child of God. I've been set free. I'm clean. I'm forgiven. And I'm going to in the discussion right there. Just, Lord, just help my mind to keep thinking of those things. 
Sometimes at the newspaper, we would get phone calls from people who would say, can you go onto your website and take a story off that was about me five, six, seven years ago? Because I did something that is keeping me from getting a job. In other words, they didn't say they weren't innocent, or they didn't say they weren't guilty. They just said this record is still there, and they may have fulfilled their duty by spending time in jail or paying a fine, whatever it was, but that stayed with them. And I always pass them on up the line, but the, but the, the facts are what they are, you know? We're, we're, we don't rewrite history. So, in our case, once we know Christ, and we've been a lawbreaker in the past, Someone can Google search us all we want and they're not going to find any wrongdoing. They're, our name is not going to come up as being a lawbreaker. because Not because of what we did. Because we weren't guilty. But it's because of what Jesus did for us. He gave us His freedom, His forgiveness. We have to just claim it and live in that freedom. Amen? So that, that's the wonderful thing. We don't need a good lawyer. We just need a great Savior. That's Jesus Christ. Again, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Back in Romans 5 and verse 8, there's a verse that I really like, and it says that God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to go through and do all the sacrifices or clean things up in our personal lives. You know, um, spend five years feeling bad for what we did. We just have to receive what he did for us. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Just to pose that with something where we say, well, after you spend five years living a sin-free life, God will maybe see you. You know, you might get a word with God. No, it's immediate. The sacrifice or the forgiveness is immediate and it's all because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So he is the final sacrifice. He could do what the earlier sacrifices could not do. A passage that's really good along this line I'd like to share with you is Hebrews chapter 10. So I'll just read that for you today. It says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And here's the kicker right here. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus' sacrifice was complete. It was final. Nothing else needs to be done to gain our acceptance by God. The idea of Christ in us is a great thought. Jesus Christ has come into our lives. And I can respect that. I can actually embrace that. But just reading something today before church, it really made me think it's the opposite of that, which is instead of Christ in me, which I believe it's me in Christ, that I am now in Christ. And the difference to me is I have now put aside my desires, my selfish ambitions, my putting me first, you know, as they say, look out for number one, put that aside. And now it's 
me living in Christ. So that Christ becomes my identity, not me. Remember the scripture verse, you know, I have been crucified with Christ. The life I live is no longer me who lives, but it's now me living in Christ who died and gave himself for me. That's, that's what we should aspire to. That's what I should aspire to. So that I put myself down so that Christ can be raised up in my life. If that's the case, I don't think there's any question that it's going to be evident in all of our relationships to people with other folks. Just They're just going to see it. It's going to naturally come out. So that's the beauty. It's never about what we do. It's about what Jesus Christ is. It's about what God has done for us. Lest we get that wrong. I'll say it again. It's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus Christ did for us. Sacrifices and offerings he was not impressed with. He wants a broken and a contrite heart. A heart that goes towards him. That's what he wants. We do that. We're putting ourselves in a good position with God, I believe. So, what do we do with the law? Because the law is still there. We, we read that uh, Paul said the law is holy and righteous. It's good. There's nothing wrong with the law. What do we do with the law then? Well, at this point, we should embrace the law. It doesn't mean now that we have Christ in our lives, we're going to go out and do whatever we want, even if it's against God's Designed because, well, he's forgiven us. You know, we're covered by the grace of God. No, now we, would, more than ever, we should want to maintain the law. We should abide by the law, but not out of a feeling of guilt or duty or responsibility or obligation, but should be out of the love we have for Christ. Out of that relationship should come everything. And the more we obey God, just think how much better our lives would be. I still think that, you know, just like this, Man, Lamont McIntyre lost 23 years of his life in prison, basically, because he was being held on something he did not do. So many of us, we are in bondage, we're enslaved, we're in prison by things that we just won't let go of. Things that maybe we did in the past or, or things that we consider ourselves to be victims of. And kind of like what Mr. McIntyre said when he was set free, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to live in the guilt. I don't have time to live in the shame. I don't have time to live feeling like I've just really blown it and that God will never really be able to forgive me. Because all we have to do is remember, it's not about us. It's about what Jesus Christ did for us. That's the difference. That's the key. So the law still plays a vital role in the life of the believer. But again, it's not as the means of salvation, but it's more of a guide. It, it keeps us on track. We obey it now out of love and devotion to God. And how do we do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Can't do it on our own. If we could, then there would have been no need for Christ to come and die for us. We cannot do it on our own. Jesus Christ did not just die for our sins. Remember, He gave us a comforter, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who came into our hearts. When we became Christians, when we accepted Jesus Christ, we began to have the power of the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. Some people call the Holy Spirit an it. Well, it's not an it, it's a he, it's a person. The power of the Holy, Holy Spirit, there's a, the, 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 the living Holy Spirit is in our lives. And through that Holy Spirit, we have power that we may not have ever tapped into. It's just there for the taking. But we have to welcome the Holy Spirit into our lives. It doesn't just end with the Father and the Son. That's typically where I think a lot of us have left it. You know, we, we, we realize there's God the Father and He sent Jesus Christ and then Jesus was here on earth and He raised from the dead. And then we kind of don't always get to the other person of the Trinity, do we? The Holy Spirit. Some do, but some of us don't. And I would encourage us today to really welcome the Holy Spirit into our lives. Because through the Holy Spirit, we're, we're going to get the power to live for Christ. If we try to live for Him on our own, it's always going to be a struggle. And I think that's what Paul was talking about. In the flesh, even though we want to do it, it's very difficult to do it. With the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to do that. So, the next thing as we conclude is this. How do we take all of this and put it together in our life. 
And it's found, and I'm going to read these verses again. I'm going to pull out a different Bible here real quick, just so, because you already read the other version. So, Romans 8, 5 to 11. Let's just read those verses as we close. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Makes sense. Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature controls your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. You know, you go back into the Old Testament, you know, remember, I'm set before you life and death. Choose life. Sin has come in through Adam. That's death. Life has come in through Jesus Christ. That's what we want to follow. Letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile towards God. Never did obey God's laws and never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But here's the good news. Here's the hope. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. In other words, if you have Christ in you, you've got the, the Holy Spirit living in you. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Not by our sacrifices, not by what we do, but by what Jesus did for us. That's how we were made right with God. And then this verse, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, which is a lot of power to raise a person from the dead. So that same Spirit lives in you. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from Christ from the dead lives in you and lives in me if we know Christ. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. So as we wrap it up today, I would just say this. Let's tap into the Spirit that's in us. It's in us if we know Jesus. You may have kept Him at arm's length. We may not have understood it. Maybe scared of the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't know. I don't know what, if we were to go around the room, I don't know what we would hear, honestly. But He's a comforter. He intercedes for us. He is always pulling for us. He encourages us. To follow Christ. Sometimes we need encouragement, don't we? Life gets hard. When life gets hard, we need someone to kind of grab us by the hand and pull us along. It's hard to go on our own, isn't it? It is for me. I'm thankful that if I'm kind of down, my wife is usually up. If she's kind of struggling, I'm hopefully going to be there to lift her up. That's the beauty. But you know what? God is always there to lift us up if we're having difficulties. We just have to respond by allowing him to do that. He stands ready today to declare us all not guilty. Jesus Christ has declared us once and for all not guilty by what he did for us on the cross. He's given us now the power to live with peace and joy, contentment and love. It's going to just show. It'll be evident in our relationships with others. It'll be evident in how we treat our co-workers, our family members, people in the church, everybody, neighbors. It's just going to be there. And here's the best part. We don't have to work at it that much other than just to, really about the only effort I can think of is, Lord, bring me back to that point where I'm serving you. You know, if that's an effort, then I'll plead guilty. But to me, that's not working. That's just asking for God to take over. But we got to make sure that we let God do that, kind of reset us day by day, moment by moment, and put us back on that right track where he's going to lead us right where he wants us. So, so we have good news that though we have not always kept the law to the extent that we would like, nonetheless, we have been found not guilty, and we've also been justified through what Jesus Christ did for us. Through nothing of our own, it's the gift of God in Jesus Christ. Let's live in that freedom as we go forward. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the gift, the wonderful gift, Lord. It's just almost hard to put into words how wonderful it is what you have done for us, how you've set us free from the bondage, the imprisonment that we have felt sometimes from being in sins and habits and addictions, whatever it might be, Lord, 
you stand ready to lift us out of that. And you bring us through it and you get us out of it, Lord, if we'll just let you. Lord, we ask today you take us by the hand. Help us to quit trying so hard on our own. Help us to be led by the Holy Spirit and to live for you and to just see what happens, to see your love come flowing through us to others. Lord, we ask for your peace and your blessings on each person here and those that couldn't be here today. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Help us to receive that gift today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've got one final song today. I do want to thank Joe and Angie for being there. Hopefully we'll be able to... Now, y'all can... If you guys are humming out there, I didn't see it. I'm not going to call Bishop Sons and tell them that y'all were humming. So if you're humming, I'm not going to say anything. I'm kidding. But, but, but no, we'll be hopefully doing more congregational singing. Hey, before you guys start, one time, I think it was the last... Uh, it was one of those Lent services right before the coronavirus shut us down. And I was sitting right over here. There's only about 20 people in the audience. And my sister was back there. And she said what I was thinking afterwards. She said, man, that sounded like a choir. There's some good singers here. So hopefully your voices won't be muffled much longer. But anyway, God bless you guys. Here's our last song. Now and forever, in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.